I've actually never seen what it looks like on the other side. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Hi guys. <clears throat> so this is a uh, this is a session that's going to start off with a little theory, and then we're going to show some cool toys at the end uh, about enterprise volumes, uh, or really, I guess, kind of the journey that Cinder's going through now. Ironically, um, this session was scheduled at the same time as the Cinder Design Summit, but not part of the Cinder Design Summit. So uh, it's uh, most of the decisions are happening in the other room. So if you want to go over there, now's the time. But uh, <laughs> all right, so here's what we're covering. Uh, first, we're going to talk about uh, enterprise storage concepts and OpenStack primarily, um, kind of some of where Cinder's going as it grows up uh, through Grizzly. Uh, so a little DevOps in you, current design uh, questions around Cinder, and then some toys that Rackspace is doing uh, along with NetApp. All right, so this is Robert Esker. Hello. I did not authorize the use of that photo. It was on your LinkedIn, dude. All right. It's on the internet. It's free for use, right? All right. <laughs> P.S. All of the pictures in here are ripped off of Google Images. So, uh, yeah, this is Cody. Cody's a long time uh, uh, racker. We used to call him the grandfather of virtualization, but now he's the uh, big daddy of cloud. Yeah. <laughs> and then me. OK. Uh, so when we think of big iron IT and a lot of the reason that cloud is so compelling for enterprises, uh, storage tends to come up as one of that. Not because uh, it's too overly complicated or it requires extra uh, specialization, because it's basically in use everywhere, right? Uh, but what we do say is that traditional IT, uh, IT models are either specialized or they're segregated or layered. You know, it kind of mimics the, uh, the ISO model, uh, where if you have an application, it doesn't really talk to anything below it. It's kind of agnostic of what it's running on. Uh, it might be aware of other members behind a load balancer, or it might know of other functions like caching servers, but it has no idea if it's on, let's say, uh, a super fast tier of storage. It has really no idea if it's on uh, aggregated uh, Ethernet links, right? It doesn't. And that's just kind of the way that uh, applications were designed. So when we talk about, uh, this is actually a picture, I don't know if you guys know from Hackers, this is the Gibson mainframe. But uh, yeah, so the, the traditional IT model is very strong, uh, uh, smart infrastructure, and dumb apps. As we move from traditional IT into a cloud model, what you see is smarter apps that make the decisions for the infrastructure. Okay, now that's different. There is gonna be some people in the Cinder community who would say that there is no place for enterprise storage uh, in cloud. I actually disagree with that. Uh, I think that that is uh, a bit naive of a perspective. Uh, I think, uh, what is it, $200 billion or whatever across the uh, storage industry can't go wrong. Uh, but uh, I do think that there is a place and that it is transforming and that it's gonna transform us as IT uh, consumers and as IT specialists. It's, gonna, it's going to change developers, the way you write applications. Because in cloud, it's not that things get dumber, it's that decisions are made in different layers. Right? When you talk about uh, giving your storage components, the actual physical shelves of disks and the, the, the controller arrays, when you ta start talking about giving those APIs that can be consumed directly by the application living on it, you move the decision-making power into the app. Okay, this is the magic of cloud. This is where we're all going. Okay, so it's not that, if you wanna, I guess I could have done it. I got cats and dogs for DevOps. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, um, I forgot what it was. I got smarter apps, thanks, yeah, yeah. So you're talking about smarter apps that have the ability to, uh, to make sense of the underlying technology. So I got three pictures here. 
Um, this is like what we think of. Most of us, this is probably what our developers and our engineers look like. Cats and dogs fighting. Um, this, of course, over here is DevOps, if you guys don't know what that is. Uh, what's the fastest way to get results out of two groups that hate each other? Give them the same goals, right? Put them on the same team. Make them have to work together. Uh, <clears throat> then there's certain freaky individuals in your team that are going to end up like this. This is where DevOps ends up. If you guys have any experience with it, you get weird cat-dog hybrids. Uh, and these are the guys in your groups. I'll tell you, if you have people here who are both operationally experienced and are pretty good developers or vice versa, whatever their focus is, these are the guys that you want to take care of. Okay, because they are going to be the ones who end up designing the infrastructure and application together. Okay, who designs your storage platform in cloud? These guys. Who designs the caching layers? These guys, right? It won't be devs or operations, but guys who understand both. Okay, so without further ado, let's talk about uh, storage design questions in Cinder. This here is <clears throat> shamefully ripped off of Google Image Search. This is a SQL Server cluster from some Microsoft knowledge base. And uh, <laughs> so we have here uh, uh, centralized storage, which is, I guess, where this is going. Um, a lot of current clustering design uh, mechanisms, such as like quorum disks or uh, you know, active passive, they rely not on multiple copies of data everywhere. Sometimes that's really inappropriate. It's difficult to write, as you guys know. And uh, there's not, not too much that can be done there when you start talking about uh, uh, the need for atomicity in data and whatnot. Um, shared storage, however, gives you that. In OpenStack, this design paradigm is currently impossible unless you do terrible things like try and keep your own data in sync through something like DRBD uh, or some really weird, you know, crazy witchcraft. The reason being is that you can't mount volumes on two instances. Okay, so there's, there's a few things here. Uh, these are what we uh, chose to talk about, the three types of, I guess you could call it storage designs that Cinder doesn't really have an analog for right now. <clears throat> First, shared volumes, which I was just talking about. Second is storage tiering. Uh, sometimes it's not appropriate to have all of your uh, file archives on SSDs, but you do want to keep maybe uh, some Oracle database on SSDs. You don't really get that option in Cinder, okay? You kind of get one or the other. Uh, and then third is shared file systems. Uh, these are uh, for more of your network file systems, NFS or SIFS. And uh, actually, if you want to maybe get your voice, my voice is running out, if you want to start talking. Okay. These three. All right, well, yeah, so it, it's interesting timing, interesting chronology, because uh, as, as Paul had mentioned, the, the design summit is, is continuing in elsewhere at the same time. So some of these, uh, the approaches to this, having solved some of these problems are being contemplated as I speak. Uh, that said, there are, there are ideas, there are blueprints that approach each one of these. So shared volumes actually, I think, is fairly simple to, to accommodate, fairly simple to deal with. And it, it's a fortunate consequence of some of the early design decisions when, when Nova and, and the subcomponent Nova volume were originally created. Uh, it's not explicitly provided for that uh, cross instances you could have access to one volume, but it's not an immense amount of code. So I think that's something that we expect to sail through fairly easily. I can't, I can't promise it for Grizzly, but I, I also have a hard time imagining why it wouldn't make it. Uh, storage tiering is somewhat more interesting. Um, uh, really what, what we, you know, there, there are differing approaches to it. I'll just very briefly speak about some of NetApp's thought process and design what we did for Essex originally, and then again in, in uh, Folsom in, in a, a couple different variations on that theme, we ended up taking a, a very poor, a very infrequently used parameter vol type, and we used that to align to things that you can arbitrarily create on the back end, a storage service catalog. You create your own tiers, and you can select from them. But to be clear, OpenStack actually doesn't understand what those tiers are. This is you know, we're just basically doing, uh, you know, string compare. Hey, it's the right one, good, so we'll, we'll yeah. serve it up. The gold, silver, platinum. Yeah, yeah. And, and gold, silver, platinum has no specific meaning to OpenStack, or, or, nor does any other, other uh, similar con construct or definition. Um, 
so that was that was a way of dealing what was with what was there. It was expedient, and I think a lot there's a, a tremendous amount of effort right now to take some a, a, a table that's not currently used. It's provided for called volume type extra specs to like inform what a given backend actually provides, where you would have multiple backends for different tiers, and then allow Cinder and you know the scheduler thereof. To, to make the right decision. We ended up doing that on the back end independently of that because OpenStack itself doesn't actually provide for it. The promise is that OpenStack will and we'll have to get, we can get out of that business. Um, again, that's something that's being, being discussed right now. And then shared file systems is definitely not provided by Cinder. Indeed, the, the name Cinder kind of sounds like a block something, right? Cinder blocks. Um, uh, that said, uh, we've heard from a number of folks saying, you know, okay, well, how do I co coordinate cross instance uh, shared access, you know, shared file systems? There's lots of application types in the world that care about that, or maybe it's just actually a certain level of collaboration between inhabitants of an instance. Um, and so we've prototyped some work, which we'll talk about in further detail tomorrow morning at 9.50. Uh, we'll show off the prototype. Uh, the blueprint exists. There's a, a draft functional spec on the OpenStack wiki that adds shared file system support uh, to Cinder specifically. Now, uh, this being a community, uh, we'll, we'll see if, uh, if, uh, if indeed the wider Cinder uh, um, constituents uh, uh, agree to take it. If not, then we'll, we'll pursue it slightly differently, perhaps as a, a different incubated service. The point is we're bringing shared file system support to OpenStack, so a little bit of what what's what's not there and what's on its way. Cool. Okay. And that's. Are you willing to take questions on that? Rick? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Is that multi-tenant? Yeah. Well, that's. Is that oh, multi-tenant? Well, how are you defining a tenant? <laughs> so. Uh, yeah. Okay. So. 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 so uh, the, the, rather, rather than answer that specifically with what we prototype, um, I, I think what probably makes the most sense is is to to point out that. We're providing the basic plumbing, the expansion of the Cinder API itself to request and receive shared file systems across instances. But there are a lot of other considerations like, you know, per, per you know, and then by the way, this support is sufficiently abstracted that we're not, you know, we don't care about what the actual shared file system is. It can be a SIS or in a variety of NFS or any number of other things. I presume that, you know, Gluster could be used or, or maybe, you know, there's, there's, we could go on. Uh, <clears throat> the point is, is there are other considerations like, you know, permissioned masks and, and what is the username, you know, what is the authority for, for user namespace. Um, these are things that, frankly, aren't going to be coordinated entirely in Cinder. There'll probably be some interaction with Keystone or there may be a presumption that you have an existing uh, a user, uh, um, you know, like an or open direct or a, uh, an LDAP of some sort that, that, uh, that exists to accommodate that. So. Tenancy, uh, that's another phase, I think. You know, doing cross-tenant, uh, that gets way more complicated and there's implications on, on what that looks like with quantum as well. Uh, so we're, we're starting with the plumbing and uh, I think over time, uh, you know, the full realization of something like a cross-tenant coordination would, would, uh, would, would be realized. I, I, could, I wouldn't expect that to be a grisly thing. So can, to put that another way, can you take an existing file system Yeah, that's the way the way we um, the way we built it. It would be sure. Question. Oh, uh, would one expect to be able to uh, take an existing file system, uh, of which there are lots in the world, populated with lots of useful stuff, um, and then uh, event that amongst instances? And the way we prototyped it, that should be uh, a possibility. And what's the name of that session tomorrow? Um, I think it's called Unified Definitely Storage unified Infrastructure uh, for OpenStack. And that's done a lot of work for uh, to kind of fill in the gaps where Cinder doesn't have maturity yet. A lot of that's behind the scenes. You only get one asserted behavior. Uh, <clears throat> so hopefully as, uh, as these grizzly designs are kicking in, we'll see more, um, we'll see more of those gaps being filled in officially more, uh, more APIs providing uh, specs for functionality. Um, so there's one question that comes out of, of all of this is uh, if you're looking to build a private cloud uh, and you want to 
particular, uh, take a particular vendor, say like NetApp or UMC, how do you know what you're getting is gonna work, right, with, uh, with Cinder, with OpenStack? How do you know if A, uh, they have the functionality you want, and B, if it, if it actually is not just marketing speak or if it actually has substance there? Because uh, there's a lot of that going around that you guys haven't noticed. Um, so what I want to talk to you about now is something Rackspace is doing. This is kind of the toy demo, which I think you guys will uh, appreciate, uh, some of you Linux folks in here. And uh, so where Rackspace is starting is a vendor qualification lab. Um, what that is is a way of answering that question. It says here are certified vendors and software, uh, so both hardware and software, that we know works according to their design specs and works with OpenStack at large. Uh, we are, right now it's off of the Ubuntu stable packages, but we're looking to uh, extend that right off to trunk so that if you uh, just yank down OpenStack, it's gonna work on this model of, the, of NetApp Filer or it'll work on um, that model of Dell Switch or, 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 or whatever. So this extends for both storage and into quantum as well as compute. Um, <clears throat> this is a little block diagram of it. Here, well I didn't, it's almost illegible, I apologize. <laughs> uh, so, what we want to show you now is um, just a, a cool tool. We actually thought it was so cool that you guys might want to use it too. Uh, it's called Razor. It's actually written by EMC. Uh, Razor is a bare metal provisioning thing. Um, Cody's going to. Played with Razor so far. You over here? This side, not so much. Okay. <laughs> All right, so this will be a demo either, for either the stage that right. Or stage right has fallen asleep. Yeah. <laughs> right. One of the two. Well, we've got pictures of the slide going on. I don't want to interrupt. Yeah. Come on now. Okay. We're going to. So what Razor allows us to do is we have uh, we have like 600 physical servers that we have cut up into various uh, roles that we play with. It's almost impossible to manage because we're deploying uh, OpenStack to it. Uh, well, to each of those clusters, like six times a day. Actually, it's madness you, to try and do that. Back, back. Read what I've got there. I can make it a little bigger. So we've got thumbs up. So what you're looking at here is, uh, actually, did you have Razor pictures in your desk as to how the no, process works? I didn't. So we'll just kind of ad lib the process. We have Tom here to correct me if I get anything wrong. Uh, Tom is one of the two authors of Razor, so I will try not to screw it up. I mean, we've only spent the last two weeks together. So um, what happens when a node boots into Razor? So Razor assumes a DHCP server on your network with a configured next server, and beyond that, it handles the rest, right? So it ships with a TFTP server, you boot up, you pixie, it pulls down a 20 megabyte or so microkernel, 40, 40 megabyte uh, tiny Linux distro that basically boots up and pulls all of your hardware information. That's pretty much what we're looking at there under the tags is a brief summary of the hardware information. So we've got VMs up with a uh, single NIC, single CPU, uh, some amount of memory, and it, I, because they're running in Fusion on my laptop here, it identifies them as VMware VMs, right? If they were uh, hardware, it would identify the piece of hardware. If they were uh, Zen VMs or KVM VMs, it would identify what hypervisors those came from. And that's actually really important as you get into uh, some of the other aspects of Razor. So let me pull out my cheat sheet here. So we did, uh, I was supposed to show off Razor image. <coughs> so images in Razor are basically your ISOs. So what we have here, the bottom one is a debug of the microkernel just made things easier for the demonstration, and the Ubuntu 12.04 standard ISO, right? We loaded these in last night kind of thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Didn't want that coming out over the speakers. It's never pleasant, right? <coughs> All right. Next is uh, we build a couple of models in Razor. So models are the they're what you apply in policies or so. So you, you take a policy, assign it a model. That model is also assigned an image. So what we have here is a, a basic Ubuntu deployment uh, using the, the mm -hmm. Linux deploy template. We've given it a description, and it, it's got a UUID, right? Fairly simple. But what I can do with this one image is I can provision compute nodes, controller nodes, uh, Swift nodes, you name it. Anything that, you know, it's, it's all a very basic Ubuntu install. Right, and where that's important is as we get down into the weeds here. So we have a couple of policies. Um, 
one for compute, the other for uh, an all-in-one, so compute and controller all in the same, uh, same box. And we've also tagged them. So my controller is tagged at one gigabyte of memory. So if you look up top, where we have the Razor node list, there's one of those with one gigabyte of memory. Right? If I had 100 of those with one gigabyte of memory, I could all, I, you know, when I apply that policy, they all reboot, they all become uh, OpenStack all-in-ones. Right? Um, you can also set maxes and minimums on your policies, so the counter there, right? if I had a max, which is just to the left of it there, of say 10, I would get 10 all-in-ones. Right? Um, so let's, let's go ahead and enable that policy and see what happens. It's hard to type when you've got 150 people staring at you. So what you'll see here is uh, we have A for active and B for bound. So what happened is my one with uh, one gigabyte of memory that was running the microkernel checked in. Razor said, hey, I've got something for you. It bound that policy to that node and is rebooting. So it TFTP booted, pulled up the menu and is going to start pulling down the iPixie for, or an iPixie and then an Ubuntu installer, and it's just gonna kick off. Um, before that gets too far, I wanted to, a couple other things we can do over here. Uh, so, oop, active model, model, there we are. So, we've got an active model, right? That's the third <laughs> one to bind to it. simultaneously watch this thing install as well as what's going on in the active model in the logs. So it init, it pulled up, it got a boot call, it pulled down the pre-seed file, acknowledged the pre-seed, and then it's going to sit here at a purple screen and embarrass me. <laughs> right? um, generally this takes about a minute, minute and a half as that comes up. So Yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, so we'll where this is going, and Race is a great tool. Uh, what I really like about it, Razor, compared to other things, there's like I think ten different suites of applications that do this so the, similar bare yeah, metal stuff. Yeah, the Y of Razor is that what yeah. we're talking about? So the the Y of Razor is uh, Razor is very specific at what it does. It's it it doesn't try to do everything. It doesn't try to be your DevOps framework and your provisioning framework. It is just the provisioning framework. It has a broker that will let you once the node is installed, hand off to whatever that DevOps framework is. So you have your, your area of expertise, like Razor does provisioning, it does provisioning really, really well. DevOps does everything else really, really well once you have the OS bits laid down. And that's, the, the DevOps framework would be like uh, a chef puppet or, or chef. puppet, yeah. Rackspace well. is kind of a chef shop, so ops code kind of, while, uh, while Matt was drinking last night, agreed to uh, write a broker for chef. So if you see him, you should razz him, be like, hey dude. <laughs> so that's the other one that embarrasses me, so we will. This is just because this is on his laptop. It has no, uh, yeah. Come on. Is this yeah. targeting Ubuntu mostly? This will actually run anything. It actually even do Windows. So yeah, you can do Windows and Hyper-V, Ubuntu. You can do Red, Red Hat, Hat, KVM, yeah. you name it. What's, uh, what's triggering the resource to IPMI, or how are you uh, saying it's being monitored through the device? Yeah, through IPMI. You can, okay. register, well, you so can register them. Okay. Actually, once you're booted in the microkernel, the microkernel occasionally checks in with Razor at a configurable interval. I think it's 30 seconds by default, 60 seconds by default. So once every 60 seconds, that 20 meg image is booted in memory, it, or 40 meg, sorry. 40 meg image is booted in memory. It checks in with the Razor server and says, hey, do you have a command for me? Hey, do you have a command for me? So is that something you're talking about an unprovisioned server, right? It's not something that's already running on a provisioned server. Yeah, you can. Uh, yeah, you set your service to boot off of the network. So what it'll do is when it detects that you've deleted this server, sure. it'll sure. do an IPMI yeah. reboot. You know, you were talking about, I want to apply it to 100 nodes. If those aren't in that pulling cycle and they're already provisioned, so, isn't that where the IPMI yes. 
if they're, if they're already provisioned in Razor, you would delete the active model and reboot them however you would normally reboot servers. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was wondering, would you have a provision in Razor to go yeah. out and do some protocol to, to reboot them? There is, uh, there is one. Yes. Actually, yes. Uh, so what we're doing is we I'm have a little chef on. roll called reboot that we apply to it. <laughs> so uh, that's just because uh, this is only one part of of what you see. Yeah. Um, it's one part of a sequence of events that lets us, yeah. uh, what is it, continuous integration is the buzzword of the yeah. word. So it, it yeah, lets we, us. Yeah, you can't, you can't can register you the. can't register a BMC. Yeah. I screwed it up, sorry. You can register a BMC okay. with Razor and use Razor slice commands to interact with that BMC. Uh, the piece that we haven't written associated with the node itself. So when we register a node, we need to check if there's an associated node. When we register a node, we need to check and see if there's an associated BMC. So where we're going with this is, uh, this is kind of how we are doing our CI for, uh, for, well, I guess what's now Grizzly code. It's gonna say Folsom. Um, <clears throat> so this gives us like a, a base install in about three minutes. Then we punch down Rackspace Alamo, which is the private cloud software. You can go download it. Uh, afterwards, that takes about 17 minutes. We won't show you all of it. Uh, and then actually, if you want to, yeah, I'll just go back. You guys have seen Ubuntu install, right? Yeah. If you do outside, it'll be more than happy to yeah. show you. Yeah. Um, so in here, what we do is perform a battery of tests. And this is really where, uh, where we ensure that OpenStack running on uh, this hardware that we're certifying uh, matches. So this includes, uh, so our, our DevOps framework for Chef or whatever will also do uh, provisioning of storage nodes or of network devices, uh, things like that. We're, internally we just have a, a couple of vendors we were, uh, for, for storage that we're talking about since it's enterprise volume. Uh, we've been actually working really heavily with NetApp on this. They're kind of uh, ahead of the pack, so to speak. Um, <coughs> Cool, so let's go, uh, this is kind of, hold on a second. Uh, so the, the next thing I want to show you is uh, th these tests here take like six hours to run. They take forever. They're really quite invasive. They uh, stress test and make sure that performance of, uh, uh, of gear is up, to, uh, is up to par. It makes sure that uh, every little component that can be set is set. It's pretty, pretty thorough. Um, so I don't want to show you that. I will show you the walkthrough of kind of how it does. So this is what B would be like, what, uh, NetApp would see from their portal. Go ahead and flip it. Oh, you did. Never mind. Uh, this is um, <clears throat> this is actually something that probably none of you will will see unless you have some hardware you want to uh, to certify OpenStack certification, right? Uh, so log in, click it. All right. This is the part that would take forever. This is uh, an overview. Um, this particular one, because glance, we made glance fail, uh, only took like four hours to run. <laughs> So you click the little details button, and it'll bring you to, huh? It's sick. What did I say? Oh. Yeah. Is that showing up? Weird. It looks different on the little screen. Uh, so here you can see, uh, here's failure to create volumes. Here's the list of volumes types failed. So this, what this is doing is saying, like, hey, uh, the driver that you provided so uh, did not match the expected results that we set. So this could mean, um, uh, could, could mean a number of things, right? Most likely it means that there is either a, uh, an undocumented configuration that we need to add in, make sure it gets added into the installation document uh, for OpenStack and this platform. Uh, just a variety of things like that. <coughs> um, once it's done, this is a little, guys just threw this in last night. I included it, but a little <laughs> certified achievement lock. Yeah, so the, uh, uh, so, uh, so in this, when, when you get here, it's going to show up on, uh, on Rackspace's certification page. So you can, anyone can go see, like, hey, I want, I want OpenStack. Here's the vendors I have. Let me see what platforms they have that will work with what I've got, right? Uh, so it might even be hardware you already have in your data center, but you actually have no way of knowing that right now. I don't have any way of knowing right now. Uh, so, so this is what we're trying to build. Um, to be, to be Still kind of in the works a little bit. Like I said, NetApp's the furthest along. Uh, so we're working through those vendors. Um, so that's all we have for this. 
I guess if you guys have questions. No? Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah Razor's cool, huh? I don't know if you're on or not. So we do have a, an M collective. <laughs> can, can everybody hear me OK? Yeah. Yes. Here we go. Um, Razor, the microkernel has an M collective channel built into it. So it should be possible to use M collective, the marionette collective, for those of you who are not familiar with it, to, to add custom facts to individual microkernel instances. Um, I think you might be able to do it if you had a map of MAC addresses for where you are in the rack or, or serial numbers for, for system cards. Or we collect a lot more than just what's in factor, actually. Uh, we run LSCPU and LSHW on the microkernel as well. And you know, Cody could show you a list of the attributes that are there. It's, it's fairly extensive. Uh, we actually filter it down to make it more we can get down to the level of uh, which NICs are in, in which slots in the chassis uh, if we really wanted to. So I think probably most of the metadata is there that you need. But somewhere along the line, someone's going to have to map something about the box into a rack position. And they're going to have to store that somewhere. And we would just have to work out how to interface with that system to map it to a location in a rack in a large data center. It's certainly something that needs to be not there right now. But then again, Razor is, is pre-1.0 at this point. Yeah, there's the list right there. So you can see the UMKW you know, stuff there. That's all through LSA, so you know, CPU. Uh, the other uh, facts are collected through Factor. And Factor would pick up a custom fact that was inserted with the M collector. There we are. Well, I mean, the community develops stuff. You know, open source as a whole essentially raises the bar. Um, and so it's contingent upon us and everyone else who wants to sell a commercial storage capability that we, we are dramatically better than that bar. Not to get philosophical or anything. Well, I think they're all very shy. Yeah, I think but they're also, still staring at us. I think we're also out of time. Oh, so. we're out of time? Yeah. Did we hit time? All right, guys, thank you very much. A very brutal.